Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Lucy Fuller with the Charleston Animal Society, and today we're going to talk about public health and zoonotic diseases, especially as it applies to um, animals in the shelter. All right. So first of all, <laughs> what does zoonotic mean? Because that's kind of a crazy word. Zoonotic refers to any disease that can be transmitted from an animal to a human and cause illness. Um, so there are a lot of different ones that are zoonotic, but we're going to talk about a few that you might be potentially exposed to or your staff might be exposed to uh, working in a shelter setting. And some of these apply to people who work in veterinary clinics, the more traditional clinic setting as well. Uh, but I feel like in the shelter, we are especially at risk because of the number of animals we see. So, and the number and the variety in many cases that we see. The first one is probably the most important for everyone to understand and grasp the severity of and the seriousness of. I think pretty much everyone's heard of rabies virus. Um, and you probably know a fair amount about it, but maybe not everything that you should know, especially if you're potentially handling rabies vectors. So another definition I probably should go over that's not listed in the presentation, when I say vector, I mean an animal that transmits the virus um, or the disease. So an insect vector, heartworms are not a zoonotic disease, but they are a disease that are transmitted by an insect vector, the mosquito. So it's, it is the living thing that moves the disease from one animal to another and causes the illness. So rabies vectors are mammals. And there are specific mammals that are the most common rabies vectors. It, so rabies itself is a virus. It's deadly. It's like 99.8 something percent deadly. Um, to mammals who contract it. Um, it's transmitted in saliva typically. That's the most common place it's transmitted. There are other ways to catch it. So other bodily fluids like blood can carry rabies. But generally, it's transmitted through the saliva once an animal is symptomatic for rabies. So once they're displaying the behavioral changes typically associated with the disease, the aggression, the hydrophobia, water, the fear of water, um, those those animals are shedding rabies virus in their saliva because it's, it attacks the, the neurologic system and so it's being shed in saliva because it's in the um, nervous system in the head most commonly because it's around the brain. So it's kind of interesting. Um, it's an interesting virus, <laughs> although deadly. The main carriers or main vectors are foxes, and this is in this country um, and around here. There are different areas of the country. You may see coyotes on here, but in, in South Carolina, at least, foxes, raccoons, bats, and cats, I didn't list those in order of most common. Those are all animals that most shelters see at some point, whether they come in to be euthanized because they've attacked someone um, or because they're sick or because they just come in as stray in the case of cats, um, our shelter sees all of those species frequently. All mammals are susceptible, um, and most of them will die after being bitten if they contract the virus. So some animals will die quickly and aren't likely to transmit the virus, which is why they're not listed as the main carriers. Um, an example would be a horse. So horses get rabies. Um, and they die from rabies, but they don't typically transmit it for various reasons. Um, but they can display all those symptoms. Dogs are much less, it, certainly they can and have historically gotten rabies and transmitted it. Um, but we've done such a great job with rabies vaccination campaigns in this country that we have not eliminated dog rabies, but we've definitely brought it down quite a bit. So they're not a common source of the disease anymore. In some other countries, like, for example, Nepal, apparently, they have a lot of street dogs, and it's a big problem for the dogs to carry rabies on the street. And so they have a lot of nonprofits that are sitting around trapping the dogs and spaying or neutering them and getting them rabies vaccines. So one interesting thing about raccoons, they're a common source of rabies 
they can carry the virus and not have symptoms for months. Um, they can be in fact infected as babies and not have symptoms but potentially transmit the virus. So it's kind of scary. Um, they do get sick and die from rabies. And um, I would say of the ones, animals that have tested positive that come through our shelter, raccoons are the most common. Uh, but they can actually transmit it without obvious clinical signs. And so that's one of the reasons that in many places um, wildlife ex experts will either request or even mandate that that raccoons and other rabies carriers not be picked up and moved from one location to another because of potential for moving hotspots of rabies around. Um, so our policy at our shelter is that raccoons, if they come in, they're generally sick and they have to be euthanized. But I also euthanize ones um, that aren't sick. We don't get them that often. It only happen once or twice. Uh, but they're euthanized because they're not um, safe to relocate, not safe to be in someone's home and rehabilitated, so to speak. And the species is not, is not at risk of extinction at this point. Um, and so I don't believe that, and I also have spoken to other um, state wildlife um, experts about this, not recommended to relocate them from their original um, habitat. So how do you prevent rabies transmission? I mean, obviously, you don't get bitten by a rabid animal. <laughs> but it's not that easy. And in the shelter, there are certain, certain things you need to do when you're handling wildlife to prevent potential transmission. So as I mentioned, rabies is transmitted in saliva or blood most prominently of an infected animal. Um, and if an animal is contagious with rabies when it bites you, within 10 days of the time that it bites you, it's going to become very obviously ill. So having lots of outward neurologic signs, or it's going to die within 10 days. That's why we have rabies quarantines for most animals of 10 days. Um, so when you're handling a potential rabies vector, an animal that might be carrying rabies, you need to be very careful. So this is an animal, say, that's been presented to your shelter and has bitten someone, and you're asked to euthanize it. Um, or even contain it and not euthanize it immediately. You need to be very careful when wearing gloves or eye protection. Um, because saliva can get flung in your eye. You can wear bite protection if you're handling the animal. So bite gloves, and I'll talk about those. Um, rubber gloves as well. So if there's the potential for an animal to bite through the gloves, you know, the leather ones that you wear, wear a pair of rubber gloves underneath so that protected even still. Here's a nice picture. It's a great way to protect yourself. So these are some of the bite gloves you can use. These are pretty heavy duty ones. Um, it's also great to consider getting your staff, you know, if you're in a managerial position or if you're in a position to recommend this kind of thing, have the staff that handle animals that may have rabies. So if they're handling animals that are on DHEC quarantine or they're handling animals to euthanize and then uh, prepare for rabies testing, those people should probably be vaccinated for rabies because uh, they may be exposed unwittingly. Um, and there really is no, there's no second chance if you've been exposed to the virus and you become sick, you're going to die. So if you become exposed to the virus and you Take, you know, you know quickly and you take action, hopefully you can head the virus off. But there isn't, there isn't a recovery from rabies. So it's, it's really best not to take a chance. Um, any stray animal, especially stray cats, um, stray cats that have bitten someone, stray cats that are acting neurologic, you should handle them as if they might have rabies. Now, I don't mean you have to wear eye protection with every stray cat you handle, because I know that seems kind of crazy. But if you take a cat in, and it seems normal at first, and two days later you find it dead in the cage, or it becomes neurologic, and you've only had it for a few days, it's probably best to have it tested for rabies. Because if it did potentially expose someone in your shelter, you probably want to know. OK. So rabies is deadly, and you shouldn't. Um, you should do your best to avoid getting infected. <laughs> That's the bottom line there. 
we're going to move on to something slightly less deadly but also kind of gross, gastrointestinal parasites. All right. So I think most people who have been working in a shelter or veterinary situation for a while are familiar with GI parasites. You know that lots of animals have them. People, you know, owners see them in poop. They, um, we look for eggs in poop. So they are one of the classes of diseases or problems that can be transmitted from animals to humans, which is kind of gross to think about. Most commonly transmitted or potentially transmitted are roundworms and hookworms, which incidentally are, <laughs> or maybe coincidentally, are uh, some of the most common parasites that we see in dogs and cats. Another very common um, GI parasite that is zoonotic is Bayless ascaris, which is a raccoon roundworm. Okay, and then Coccidia is another potentially um, transmitted from um, animals to humans. Coccidia is less common, although in the shelter it's a it can be a common problem. So. GI parasites, and I put these questions here because most people know how GI parasites are transmitted. So it's called fecal oral contamination, which means poop gets in your mouth, um, or it gets on your hand and then you put your hand in your mouth. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a lot of poop. It doesn't even have to be poop that you can see. It's just poop got in your mouth. Um, clinical signs that these cause, they really can vary. So because, round, because people are not the typical host for roundworms or hookworms or Bayless ascaris, um, the clinical signs in humans of these particular parasites that generally infect other animals can be different than they are in dogs and cats. Um, and then those most at risk, you know, these are probably things that you could probably, you could guess, but um, manifestations of the disease in humans, so we are not the primary host, <clears throat> they typically are, they may cause GI symptoms, they may cause diarrhea, especially in the case of coccidia. Uh, but roundworms and hookworms, one of the reasons they're so dangerous, it doesn't, they don't just give us diarrhea, they actually migrate, they can migrate under the skin um, and then through other areas of the body, um, so they cause I've got some nasty pictures to show you. They cause some gross lesions that you don't typically see in dogs and cats. And they, they can actually cause blindness because they can migrate through the retina. Pretty yucky. As I said, coccidia can cause diarrhea. That's a pretty typical, um, straightforward thing, just like we see in dogs and cats. But in humans who, are, who contract roundworms and hookworms, we may see no clinical signs. Or uh, you may see blindness. In the case of Bayless ascaris, one of the reasons it's so scary, and I mentioned it, is because it's a roundworm that usually infects raccoons, but when it migrates through the body of a human, when it infects a human, it can actually migrate through the brain and cause neurologic symptoms, which is pretty crazy. So it's a little more serious. Certainly blindness is bad enough. If you look at these pictures, you'll see on the left there's um, there's some pathology pictures of the, what's called cutaneous larval migraines, where the, um, the larval stage of the roundworm or hookworm will move under the skin, and they cause this really burning, itching rash, this sort of a linear rash. You'll see it on the foot on the bottom left-hand side there. And then the picture on the right is a picture of one of the... Um, one of the little larval stages of these parasites migrating through the eye, especially in the sclera of this patient, which is the white of the eye. Uh, but it can migrate across the retina and cause blindness. So pretty gross. Um, groups most at risk tend to be children, uh, because children are um, often out not washing hands, uh, handling animals, putting things in their mouth that they shouldn't. Um, the old tale about not not going outside without shoes on because you get worms <laughs> can actually apply to hookworms. Uh, because hookworms can migrate through the bottom, through the soles of your feet. So if you're outside without shoes on and you're, it's kind of wet, hookworms can actually migrate through your skin and infect you that way. So while typically the infection is fecal oral, so the animal poops and has um, 
infective par- oasis or eggs in the poop, and then the poop gets in your mouth and you swallow it. You can actually get hookworms by not wearing shoes outside. It is possible. Your grandmother was right. Okay. Another, excuse me, another GI parasite is toxoplasmosis. Um, and if you've ever been pregnant um, or you've worked intake, <laughs> you've probably seen animals that were relinquished because of someone being pregnant and the concern about toxoplasmosis. So this is a parasite, and it can be quite serious. Um, it's transmitted sometimes to humans through infected cat feces, but most commonly it's transmitted to humans through infected meat. Um, if you're just a regular adult and you're not pregnant, you can be exposed to it and not have any clinical signs. Um, generally, you know, the worst case scenario, you get um, mononucleosis-like signs or mono-like signs where you get a fever, you have some large lymph nodes, you feel bad for a while. People who are immune compromised, so um, people who are immune compromised are, um, hopefully you're seeing the right slide here. I think I've changed it. Um, are more likely to be um, affected by something like toxo. Same with the other GI parasites. Um, so if, you know, someone who's been diagnosed with um, a serious immune condition or with something like HIV would be very, at very high risk of toxoplasmosis infection. Excuse me. All right. This is a picture of the life cycle of toxoplasmosis. Um, and it's got a lot of arrows. <laughs> Um, so it is possible, certainly, to get toxoplasmosis from a cat. Um, most likely, if you've had a cat in your house for a number of months, you know, if you've had a cat, and um, even if the cat goes indoor or outdoor, they're not a significant source of infection. Now, if you work in a shelter and you're changing litter boxes, you're more likely to be exposed that way. So certainly it's a great example of why you should wear gloves when you change litter boxes and then wash your hands. Um, other sources of this particular parasite are, you can look here on this little diagram, um, pigeons and rats can carry toxo. Now, generally, you're not going to be eating pigeons or rats. Most people don't do that. Uh, but you may be exposed through their feces if it's aerosolized or somehow gets, you know, if you're outside and eating and getting feces on your food or something like that accidentally. Uh, it's certainly possible. Um, another source that uh, sometimes exposes people is infected pig meat. So this isn't usually pig meat that you buy in the store. This is pig meat that you'd be catching yourself. Um, so wild hogs or hogs that are living outside. Um, and it is possible to kill these OSS by cooking meat to a certain temperature, which is why we're so big on cooking pork to at least, I think, 165, because that will kill the toxoplasmosis. But it's a great example of why you shouldn't eat, you know, undercooked pork. Um, bear meat is apparently also a great source of contamination to people and probably more common than cat feces at this point in this country. But one of the scariest parts about toxo is if you're pregnant, when you become infected with toxoplasmosis, then it can cause some serious birth defects. So um, it can be transmitted through the placenta, um, which is why you see concerns about people who have cats. Um, sometimes they'll hear from their doctor that they need to not be around cats. They need to not be changing litter boxes. Um, and once again, that it's pretty unlikely for them to get toxic from their own cat. Um, you know, it's also a great example of how you can use pregnancy to get out of change in the litter box <laughs> if you've got a partner who's willing to do it for you. Um, alternatives would be wearing gloves when you change the litter box. Um, 
you should, of course, always wash your hands after doing so. Uh, and if you're working in a shelter and you're pregnant and you're cleaning up after cats that are strays, um, then certainly wearing gloves when you're changing the litter box, washing your hands, taking extra care. Um, maybe wearing gloves when handling cats in general because you know, they can have feces on their fur without even it being very obvious. So an interesting thing about Toxo is if it's only infective if the feces has been out of the cat for more than 24 hours. Now, it doesn't have to be a large amount. So if you've got like a little smear somewhere, it could still be infective, even if you've taken out most of the feces. Um, toxoplasmosis can infect other species besides humans. It can infect birds. It can infect all kinds of animals. Um, and it can cause lots of different symptoms. Um, in people, when it is a birth defect, uh, it can often cause blindness. Um, there, there are a lot of actually a lot of things. It depends on how far along in the pregnancy uh, the mother is when she contracts it. Um, but once again, the most common source of disease in this country is raw meat or undercooked meat. Um, wild hogs, bears, uh, people sometimes eat pigeons, and so they're another potential source. So just something to look out for. All right. Next, we're going to talk about ringworm or dermatophytosis. Okay. So ringworm is not a worm. <laughs> it's a fungal infection. Its um, scientific name for the condition is dermatophytosis. It's kind of hard to say, so we say ringworm. Um, it can cause varied disease in humans. Some people or most people get a mild problem mild uh, skin rash. Some people have more generalized rash, and so they'll get lesions all over their body or on more of their body. Um, once again, anyone who's immune compromised is more likely to have a problem with this infection. Um, fun fact from the past, uh, it was a reason for quarantine or isolation at Ellis Island when people were immigrating and coming through there. So I also I like to put in presentation to ask people if they know how it's transmitted. So if you think to yourself how it's transmitted before I tell you. All right. So it's primarily transmitted by touch. So in dan in dander, which is the the flakes of skin cells that come off of an infected animal, those would fall off. They would have ringworm spores on them and then uh, the next human or cat or dog that comes through, the dander would get stuck to them, and then those spores would potentially infect that animal or person. You can also get it directly, like by putting your hand on an animal that has ringworm. Um, and one of the difficult things about it is it's really hard to remove from the environment. I mean, if you think about any room you've ever been in, dander is something that likes to you know, dust balls in rooms or hair balls often have a lot of dander in them. And it's pretty much impossible to keep a shelter free of dust or a house um, free of dust. And so <clears throat> ringworm is very persistent in the environment. It's difficult to clean. You can't kill it easily with um, a lot of over-the-counter products. You have to use things that are stronger. And it can certainly cause some pretty gnarly lesions. This little kitten has some ringworm lesions on its ears um, and its face. Pretty classic spots for it. Here's a picture of the rash in a human. Um, and it's not always this red. Sometimes it's a little bit lighter in color. Um, but it does give this classic ring appearance in people, which is where it gets its um, common name of ringworm. It's usually very itchy. So most people, when they contract this disease or this um, this rash, treat it with over-the-counter topical medication, and that's perfectly effective. Um, not for for those who are immunocompromised or have a more generalized problem, you know, more lesions all over the body, you may need to seek medical care. But for most people, it's self-limiting and just really irritating. Okay, we're going to move on to protozoal parasites. All right, so I talked about Giardia briefly before. Um, protozoal parasites are also 
types of GI parasites, but I want to specifically talk about protozoans um, by themselves. Um, so these include species like Coccidia, as I mentioned before. They also include a species called Giardia, and then another called Cryptosporidium. Um, and so these can be present in animals, and they can cause some significant problems in animals as well. Um, Giardia is seen in small animals like dogs and cats, more commonly in dogs. Um, Cryptosporidium is more commonly seen in cows, uh, but certainly um, some shelters get cows in and are exposed to them. So um, you never know what you're going to be exposed to. So these can cause serious and sometimes even life-threatening diarrhea in some humans because of the amount of liquid that's lost in a short period of time. So you get a lot, of, you get exposed to a lot of this parasite or you're already sick for some other reason. Um, you could definitely become dehydrated quite quickly. So the method of transmission is fecal oral once again. Um, and a great way to prevent transmission is to wear gloves. <laughs> So I harp a lot on PPE, your personal protective equipment, in this presentation because it is really important. And we tend to be lazy about it. I know I'm lazy about it sometimes in the shelter. My staff's lazy about it because it's just such a pain to find the box of gloves and then put them on and then change them every time you have to deal with a new animal because you're so busy all the time. But I would say a healthy dose of a GI parasite that you get from an animal is probably going to cure you of that. So. Hopefully you can uh, remind yourself of why it's important. All right. And I've put up a picture of the life cycle of cryptosporidosis. Um, now, you can get things like Giardia and crypto from contaminated water as well. Um, we're pretty good in this country about sanitizing water that um, people are swimming in or bathing in. Um, but you could be exposed if you're hiking, you could be exposed if there's a natural disaster and, um, you know, people are having problems where animals are shedding Giardia cysts or crypto cysts and then the water, you're walking through the water um, because you're trying to, you know, escape from a natural disaster, you could be exposed in that situation as well. So maybe when you're least thinking about it, um, it can happen. It's probably not going to happen at your shelter in that way if you're going to be exposed directly from an animal, but um, just something to keep in mind. By one of the reasons that you hear not to wade through floodwaters if you can help it. Okay, next up are bacterial diseases. The fun doesn't end. All right, leptospirosis is the main one we talk about here. We've got a couple. Leptospirosis is a pretty severe bacterial disease that causes kidney failure. Um, and certainly kidney failure is not always fatal, but it's certainly very serious. Um, leptospirosis can affect pretty much any mammal. Um, it's most commonly carried by wildlife, so deer and raccoons are two great sources of lepto. Um, it can also affect dogs, and so if you, um, you know, if you have a dog, you may have your dog may be vaccinated for leptospirosis. There are different uh, subtypes or different um, species of it. And sometimes um, a single area will have more than one species that affects. And so your vaccine has to cover a lot of different species of lepto. Um, this is a great example of, once again, why we wear gloves and eye protection when we handle raccoons. Because raccoons can carry lepto. Uh, and it can make them sick. Um, and a lot of times when raccoons come in and they've been trapped or um, or picked up by animal control, um, they are angry and scared because they're wild animals. And they've peed in their carrier or their um, transfer cage. And that pee can get flung around. And when an animal has leptospirosis, the urine is uh, probably the best source of potential contamination. Um, and it, so if you get raccoon urine in your eye accidentally because the raccoon is flailing around the kennel and it gets in your eye or your mouth, you could become infected. So eye protection is important. Same with rabies, you know, the the rabies of saliva could be flung around from the raccoon as well uh, and get in your eye or your mouth. 
All right. So this is a little pictograph of how leptospirosis is spread directly from the urine of infected animals as the primary source. Most dogs are exposed by drinking or swimming in water where animals who are infected have um, have been. So the animal comes to a water source in um, the woods to drink, and often when they're drinking, they also will urinate. And so that infected urine will be washed into the water source, and then the water source is now contaminated. Um, one of the reasons that you, great reason to sanitize water when you're hiking is leptospirosis. Definitely, and a GRD is another one. It's a great reason to filter it. All right, so another bacterial disease that we talk about is brucellosis. Uh, this is not as commonly known, um, perhaps, but certainly no less serious. So it's a highly contagious bacterial disease. Uh, some people may also know it by the name undulant fever uh, because it causes a fever that comes and goes or waxes and wanes. Um, it can affect many different mammals, and there are many different species of it. And humans can be infected by many of the species. Typically, we're going to contract it by contact with secretion of an infected animal. So that includes milk from an infected animal. That includes meat from an infected animal, uh, urine. Um, dogs can have, dogs can get brucellosis. It's a sexually transmitted disease in dogs. Um, and if an animal, especially a dog, has a fever, what's called a fever of unknown origin or a fever that you don't know the cause of, occasionally we, brucellosis is on the list of potential rollouts. Um, and so sometimes um, it's a reason for dogs to be put in isolation until we know the, whether or not it's got brucellosis because brucellosis is so um, contagious to people. So in, in animals and in people, it can cause abortion, um, and that's one of, the, one of the main causes of abortions in certain species. Most livestock are tested for brucellosis, and they'll have a tag that indicates that they're negative. Um, fun fact, feral hogs have about a 30% incidence of this disease in South Carolina. Um, and so if you own a pig and it lives outside, it's very likely in contact with feral hog because feral hogs are everywhere. Um, and so has the potential to be exposed to brucellosis um, and potentially become infected. Um, it's also possible for humans to become infected if they hunt and kill a wild hog, a feral hog. Um, and so if you do that, if that's something that you or someone that you care about does, then please encourage them to wear gloves um, and eye and mouth protection when they're slaughtering. So the disease can, the bacterial disease can be killed with cooking meat, but if you're exposed to, say, the, the blood or urine of the animal prior to it being heat treated, then you might be contaminated. Another little pictograph. So pretty much humans get it from any of these animals, dogs, pigs, cows, goats. They can all carry it. Um, or even samples in the lab. One of the reasons that, once again, I harp on personal protective equipment, gloves and things when you're handling body secretions, because you never know what might be in that body secretion that you can get. This is a picture of some feral hogs. Okay, so again, with the preventing transmission, it's a, it's a theme with this particular presentation. You really just don't want to get these things. So wear gloves and eye protection when you're handling potentially sick animals, especially sick wildlife. Rubber gloves when you're handling wild hogs. Hopefully you're not handling wild hogs very often, um, but certainly wear rubber gloves. Some sort of eye protection, whether it's safety goggles or large sunglasses or something to help with splash. Um, and if you've got an animal that um, has some problems with abortions or that's unexplained, then certainly be on the lookout or be concerned about brucellosis. Okay. 
And hopefully you understand that the major take home from this lesson is that you should always wear personal protective equipment when handling animals in order to prevent transmission of zoonotic disease. All right, thanks for joining me and uh, we'll look forward to the next one.